for years I sat on the sideline of the action camera game while others got all the awesome underwater shots, helicopter shots, shark shots, and bungee jumping shots. There are a lot of reasons why I always resisted getting a GoPro, but they boiled down to three main ones. One, I already had a DSLR. Two, I already had a camera phone. And three, I'm just not extreme enough to live up to a device so radical. But after seeing all these super extreme bros getting all the awesome shots, and all these years on, I really started to wonder how much my quality of life would improve if I bought another material good in the form of a GoPro. Meanwhile, the camera phone I was telling you about, that's always full. The DSLR is heavy and bulky and intimidating to friends and strangers. And since I'm Asian, generally it makes me look like a tourist. <laughs> but most importantly, when I look deep within myself, turns out that yeah, I totally am radical enough to get an action camera. So with those three reasons rationalized away, the question I had was if the GoPro was worth a $400 price tag. Because I'm a chronically indecisive cheapo, I made a pros and a cons list for this hard decision to help decide if it's worth getting one. In this case though, I went out and bought one anyways so that we could make that pros and cons list together. Despite GoPro status as a pioneer in the action camera market, there's some pretty compelling models like the e-cameras. Additionally, the Hero 4 Black, the previous model, already has pretty good image quality. Meanwhile, the Hero 5 Session is a more discreet package without the touchscreen for all your secret filming needs. The GoPro is the most expensive camera on the market, ever. So let's find out what's in the box. There's a case, a cable, a manual, blah blah blah, and of course there's the camera. There's a sticker of a sweet dog. I just want to look at this dog for a while, so just hang tight. Now let's set this thing up. The battery goes in here, the SD card goes in here. So let's turn it on by pushing the button on the right side and holding it to turn it on. Oh, okay, so no battery charge. There's a setup menu with languages. German, ugh, no thanks, English please. The camera fits into this new frame case which isn't waterproof like the old cases because, you know, there are giant holes in it. But that's okay, because the camera itself is waterproof. With the new case design, you can actually open this little door here and gain access to the USB-C and HDMI outlets, which, if you take the door off, allows you to charge the device without taking off the case. There are a lot of other accessories as well, like the Karma drone, the Karma grip, or an external microphone. But all of that stuff is sold separately and actually really expensive. Like I said, I'm a pretty big cheapo, so instead of the expensive stuff, I got this bag of accessories for 9 euros. What it lacks in quality, it makes up for in quantity. Let's see what's inside. There's this case, a bunch of mounts, something for the handlebars. Uh, cool. Bunch of nicotine patches. A suction cup, kind of sucks. A chip clip, in case you want to mount your GoPro inside of your cupboard. And what's this? Got a jock strap. A baby jock strap. And a plastic Twinkie. Or maybe it's a plastic banana. Oh, wow, and what's this? My very first selfie stick. Now, at this point in the video, I wouldn't blame you if you thought I just wanted to buy a bunch of new toys and that it wasn't extreme at all, but I actually bought this stuff because we are going to Stockholm today. Uh, we're supposed to go tomorrow morning at 8.20, but Berlin Luggage Handlers Union is on strike. Airplane or helicopter. So we just got through security in record time. Karina went to go find a bathroom. It looks like she failed. What's up? You couldn't find the bathroom? No, I do, but if, if you could find a place to where you would be, then I could I'll be leave here. my stuff with just you. Just give it to me. I'll hold it. Yes. And I'm going to put it on and pretend I'm you. <laughs> Hi. 
Berliner Luft tastes like toothpaste. Pretty good though, because I like toothpaste. Every time I see this sausage by Dior, I think sausage. It's nice that they're giving whiskey their own Snuggies now. Check it out. This wine is called Vagina. V Am I saying this right? Vagina. Huh. How about that? Okay, so we just got onto a very full plane, but I never explained to you why we're going to Stockholm in the first place. I was offered a job in Stockholm. I like the job, I like the team, I like the project. The question is, is how do we like Stockholm? So, guess what? We're going there for the weekend to find out. Flying in was pretty easy. Getting in from the airport was easy too. We took the Orlando Express, which is a shuttle train, I guess, from the airport right to the central station. They claim it's the most eco way and the fastest way to get in downtown, and indeed, for the 40 kilometers, it only takes about 20 minutes. Super, super convenient. The thing is, it's about $25 to get a one-way ticket. If you're more than two people though, it makes sense just to take a cab because it's 47 euros from door to door. You definitely get more options than you would in Berlin, but a cab from the airport to anywhere in Berlin is about 30 to 40 euros. At that point, it's kind of a wash. The GoPro can shoot up to 240 frames per second, which is handy for slow motion. The iPhone, however, does pretty much the same thing. Now, after a good night's sleep at a nice hotel, it's time to explore Stockholm. Here's some stock footage I found of Circle's Tour, or Circle Square, which is the centralmost square in Stockholm. Here's a shop called Sticky Nikki that actually sells really good ice cream. And here's a shop called Cum, which I don't know what they sell, I guess club wear, but should not go anywhere near or around your mouth. Here's some stock footage of Gamlestam, which is Sweden's old town. There's a train. And here's another square. Stockholm gets a lot of bonus points for being very pretty and surrounded by water. The old town was founded in the 13th century by, I don't know, Vikings probably. There's a ton of old stuff here, it's really cute, a lot of little windy alleyways, a lot of tourists too. In the old town, there's the Royal Palace and the Royal Palace Museum, and there's also royal guards that patrol the grounds and do some sort of guard changing ceremony every hour, but I didn't take any footage of it because I don't really care. In the old town, there's also the Stockholm Cathedral, the Nobel Museum, and a bunch of old churches and also a restaurant that's been open since 1722. Apparently, it holds a world record for the oldest unchanged interior for a restaurant, which seems like a really arbitrary thing to brag about, and really not that impressive when you consider how old and gross all the restaurants in Berlin feel anyways. In this regard, I guess it's a tie. But dude, Richard, why are you dumping on Berlin so bad? You lived there for five and a half years, I thought you liked it. Well, yeah, guys, I actually love Berlin. Well, I have very complex feelings about it. If you know me, you know my story and how I kind of end up in Berlin by accident. Never expected to go, never expected to like it. And indeed, I didn't. But there's a lot of things I can appreciate about it. And now that I'm looking at leaving, it's really scary. In some weird way, it feels like home. Berliners are a grumpy bunch, and I definitely had my share of traumas while I was there. I got laid off once, a long-term relationship ended in a really terrible way, and I got laid off again. So in one way, Berlin was a horrible place for me. But I also met the love of my life, made a lot of good friends, and discovered an amazing, dynamic, lively city that's always changing. So that's the other way of looking at it. And now, here's a statue of an alien from the movie Aliens. 
This square is Ho Toriet, or the old Haymarket, and this blue building behind it is the Concert Huset, or the Concert House. This is where a lot of Nobel Prizes are given out every year, but also a lot of classical music concerts and opera concerts too. It wasn't always so stuffy though, because back in the day, a lot of really cool acts played here. They include Jimi Hendrix, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Frank Zappa, and Patti Smith, just to name a few. While the nightlife in Stockholm may not be as lively as it is in Berlin, they do pop music pretty well with the world's third largest music industry after the United States and the UK. It's a pretty big feat considering it's a country of only 7 million. If you're not familiar with Swedish music, here's a list. The GoPro has GPS, which if you use their software, you can overlay that information on your video. This one says that I'm walking 15 kilometers per hour, which is impossible. But if walking's not your thing, Stockholm's got a pretty awesome subway system. You can buy prepaid cards and each ride is about three euros. That's a little bit more expensive than Berlin, but in Stockholm, the stations are all painted in very pretty colors, and they don't smell like pee. If you didn't know this already, Berlin uses the honor system when it comes to their trains, meaning that you can get on or off without going through any turnstiles. Instead, they hire a bunch of undercover ticket checkers to randomly bust you. It's that type of societal pressure and a deep sense of psychological shame that comes with being busted that makes most people buy the tickets. I actually prefer just buying a prepaid card and using turnstiles. It's just one less mindfuck to deal with. <laughs> We went to Södermalm, which is a hipster neighborhood in town. The actual hipster part isn't so big, so we had trouble finding it. Eventually though, we found overpriced baked goods and succulent plants. That's how we knew we had arrived. Because Berlin's been overrun by edgy meta hipsters, which are hipsters so hip that they might be addicted to heroin ironically, it was comforting to find Stockholm's hipster neighborhood to be clean, kid-friendly, slightly boring, inappropriately gentrified. I don't know if this is a pro or a con, so it doesn't get either one. What this means though is that housing costs are really, really expensive here. The entire city is small and cute, and everything is walkable. But if you want to live in an area with a lot of interesting stuff, you'll have to pay out of your butt for it. Other things are more expensive too, like eating out, beers. The most expensive beer we paid for was about $14. And though the city's really, really beautiful, it's hard not to feel ripped off from time to time. Besides all the stupid comparisons and all the glib, sarcastic comments, though, here's some real talk. When it comes down to it, I needed a job, and Stockholm has one for me. Berlin has jobs, too, but I don't know. We've been looking to make a change for a while now. This time last year, our top choices were the U.S. and the U.K. Then Brexit happened, and then Trump happened. Now I'm feeling kind of stranded. Sweden seems like a good place to hide out. And frankly speaking, from my perspective, it's just another cold, dark European country where I don't really speak the language. 
Ultimately, there's one big pro for Stockholm, which is that it has a great job opportunity for me. And also one huge con, which is that I'd have to do long distance for a while, even though Karina would be able to join me later on. I agonized a lot over this decision. It was a really, really hard one to make. If you tried to tally up all the pros and cons for all of the different choices that I had, you had two fairly equal choices that had pros and cons, both in every direction and every which way. What I realized though, is that if you have two choices that are relatively equal, then I guess it doesn't really matter if you choose one or the other. After all, if the two choices were very unequal, then that's an easy choice to make. When it comes to difficult decisions, there's no crystal ball, and really the only way you can decide is to try. After all, if I chose wrong and I tried to go to Sweden and it totally, totally sucked, then that becomes an easy decision. I guess I can just leave then. And also a big part of why this is such a hard decision to make is because I'm focusing a lot on what I'm going to lose out on. All the great stuff that Berlin has to offer, because that's a known quantity. What I'm not really focusing on is all of the great stuff that I have to gain by going to Stockholm. I think part of that's because, you know, I don't really know Stockholm that well. So in the end, if you're still trying to decide if you want to buy the GoPro Hero 5 Black, I'd give this camera 4.35 out of 7 bananas for being the most advanced, jam-packed, over-the-top with features action camera without totally sabotaging its core competency, making it super simple to start shooting video while trying to do something cool. In the end, you'll have to make your own pros and cons list based on your own personal value system and decide what's right for you. Like I said, hard decisions are hard because you're inherently choosing between two relatively equal choices. After all, if one choice were drastically better than the other, then it would be an easy decision then, wouldn't it? And if the two choices seem equal, then fuck it. It doesn't really matter which one you choose since they're basically just the same. I forgot what I'm talking about now, so if you have the disposable income to buy it, then get a GoPro, and if you don't, then don't get one. I mean, I don't really care after all. As for me, I'm moving to Stockholm. <laughs>